Let's begin if we can. Good morning, aloha everyone. My name is Rob Hack. I'm on the board of the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. We call that HPEC. HPEC is one of 58 district export councils around the United States. We're just one of them out here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And um, we, two years ago, we won the District Export Council of the Year Award, uh, which we were very proud of. And HPEC is made up of approximately 30 board members that are appointed by the U.S. Commerce Secretary. There's an approval process and then we're um, placed on the board. And our job as a nonprofit here in Honolulu is to help Hawaii companies export and get ready for exporting. Small companies, medium-sized companies, and large companies, they all face um, some similar issues, but some different issues, uh, depending on where they're exporting. Out here, as I said, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, we tend in Hawaii to want to export to Asia, um, but we also help companies export to Canada, uh, Mexico, Europe, Latin America, Australia, New Zealand, India, wherever. Um, a lot of our programming here tends to focus on uh, Japan, and that's only because it's sort of the market here locally is pulling us in that direction uh, because most Hawaii companies seem to feel like Japan is their number one export market. We don't always agree with that stance, but we, we try to help companies uh, develop the most efficient export plan possible. So today is a, a somewhat unique experience for us because we're working with the Hawaii Department of Agriculture to put on an agriculture specific program. And we've done things like this in the past, but usually it would be, say, our marketing in Japan program would include some information about agriculture or our a trade show seminar would include some information about if you happen to be an agricultural company. But today, we're really focused specifically on agriculture. So we have, um, of course, our live audience. We tape these uh, uh, presentations for use later on the HPEC YouTube channel, which I invite you to uh, search for because we have hours and hours and hours of video there going over various topics uh, in exporting. And uh, then, of course, we have the live webinar audience. So I'd like to remind everybody with this disclaimer that this is a live seminar. It's online right now uh, via webinar, but we do tape it. And so any questions you ask may be part of a public forum. So please keep that in mind when you uh, ask a question and there, there could be an answer. Okay, so we've talked a bit about HPEC. What I would like to show you very briefly, if I can, is the, I have to shut down this presentation. I'll do it towards the end then. Um, I wanted to show you our website and our YouTube channel, but we'll do it at the end. Um, we work very closely with several partners in Hawaii to put together our uh, international exporting programs. Um, one of the most important partners we have is DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. And Mark Ritchie is here from DBET to say a few words about that. But uh, we get a grant every year from DBET to put on a series of programs and do uh, export training uh, for companies here in Hawaii. So we very much would like to thank DBET for that. And Mark, can you come up and say a few words? And while Mark is coming up, I'd also like to thank another um, Hawaii state government uh, organization, this foreign trade zone here where we're having our meeting. Um, they allow us to have uh, our seminars in here. And this is a great facility with fantastic Wi-Fi speed for the webinar. and. Um, it's a nice room, so thank you very much to FTZ for that. So this is Mark Ritchie from DBET. Okay. 
Hi, everyone. Aloha. Uh, my name is Mark Ritchie. I'm a branch manager at uh, DBED, and it's our division and uh, two branches, actually, that run the High Step program, which is the high Hawaii State Trade Expansion Program. And that is a program to help Hawaii companies export their products uh, throughout the world. And we receive a, a grant from the Small Business Administration, the Federal Small Business Administration, each year. And it's a competitive grant, and there's lots of sort of stipulations and things about how we can use that money. But the High Step program that we have put together actually has three components. And uh, HPAC is one of the comp partners on uh, one of those components. And the first component is training. And that's what um, this one actually is not an official HPAC. I'm sorry, this is an official HPEC event. It's not a high step funded event, but uh, most of the other ones that you'll see on our uh, sheets out there are. And that's to sort of look at uh, training Hawaii companies about how to export. Also, as part of that, it's individual company mentoring, which HPEC participates in as well. The second component is just the Hawaii pavilions that DBED does, and those are. Uh, SBA funded, but then the Department of Agriculture also does uh, pavilions uh, overseas as well. And just to put a lot of sheets out there here, so you might want to pick those up uh, on your way out. Here's the trade shows that there'll be uh, Department of Agriculture pavilion at, and then on the reverse side, these are the pavilions that uh, DBED will be doing. And we work together, and it's a little bit of a blurry area sometimes. If it's strictly an ag product, then it's Department of Agriculture. Sometimes if it's a value-added ag product, it, companies wind up in our shows, but then sometimes they also go in to the Department of Ag shows. But we work together. It's all a family. We're all a village. <laughs> so it's there, there's it's we're not siloed, hopefully, although there are different procedures and different uh, applications and things for these. The last component, and that's what I wanted to kind of make note of here, because I think there was some con some confusion that Rob had noted, is the individual company assistance part of High Step, where companies can apply for up to seventy-five hundred dollars to help defray uh, travel and then trade show uh, costs overseas if they're going into a show. Uh, this is a competitive process. We usually are about able to fund about half the companies, and we're really looking at companies that could take that $7,500 as an incentive, as sort of a subsidy, not as a full ride. We're expecting you to put in a lot of your own resources as well, but that'll help you uh, go that extra step. Let's say maybe, add, I'll give you an example, you're in Japan, but you're going to go to South Korea and then try to do some uh, marketing there for your products and things, and the $7,500 might help you do that. Um, it's an application process where you basically you're responding to an RFP that is available on the DBED website. If you go to invest.hawaii.gov and then go to the High Step program, it's one of the pull-down menus, and it's the Individual Company Assistance Program. It's High Step CA for company assistance. There's a link to the RFP that you have to respond to, and those are due in our office, hard copies, we can't accept digital copies right now, uh, January 4th. So I hope I didn't respond, run anybody's holidays here, but it's, it's due January 4th. So go and, and take a look at that. And also, uh, Yokashi and I, and, and our DBED division, in those applications, we want you to say whether you're also getting assistance from the Department of Ag programs, such as WSADA. It's not that one excludes you from the other. It's just that we want to know where your funding is coming from so there's no double dipping. And so it, tell us that, and then we will have a discussion with the Department of Ag and see how best we can, we can help you. Take a look at all these. The next session, training session we have that uh, Rob will be helping with, but we'll have people from Innovate Hawaii, and it's like scaling up for exporting, and it's about how you increase your production from an operational point of view if you're going to be out you know, expanding your sales and things overseas. Can I answer any questions at this point? And then I think is everyone good? And feel free to contact me. Just go to our website. Uh, again, it's invest.hawaii.gov. Thank you, Rob. Thank you yeah. very much for being here. Let me just double check there's no online question. Okay, great. Um, is Yukashi here? Yes. 
Oh, she's hiding <laughs> behind the book. So I'd like to bring up Yukashi Smith from the Hawaii State Department of Agriculture. She um, is our primary speaker for the day. We'll talk about uh, some of the plans that they have at the Department of Agriculture and how that can integrate a bit with high step. Uh, we're talking about specifically exporting and um, then at the after Yukashi comes up, we'll have two panel speakers and Yukashi and I will join the panel and we'll be, have a long Q&A session after that. So um, please wait till the end of Yukashi's presentation to ask any questions, please. Okay, thank you, Yukashi. Thank you, Rob. Can you hear me now? Is it okay? Okay. Hi, good morning. My name is Yukashi. I work for Hawaii Department of Agriculture Market Development Branch. So today I'm going to talk about exporting specifically ag and food products to Japan and other world. Because Japan is the top export market for ag and food products from Hawaii. So that, there's no comparison, the second and third. That's, that's the true fact. So that's why we tend to focus on Japan. But if you um, understand how to export your products to Japan market, uh, regulations are similar, uh, a little bit different, but then I think it, you can apply your uh, knowledge to other markets as well. So as an introduction, I would like to talk about what our market development branch is due. We have three primary uh, functions, and one is marketing assistance. I cannot emphasize enough that how important your marketing, the local market, is uh, to before you export your products to uh, other countries. So um, we have some logo program called Hawaii Seal of Quality to identify Hawaii made, Hawaii grown ag products. With the logo, consumers can understand what the real local products are. And we have Made in Hawaii Aloha program that also help manufacturers uh, um, in Hawaii to help that uh, differentiate uh, other products, uh, but Made in Hawaii. Also, we do uh, spend a lot of money for the PSA, uh, eat local, uh, buy local in mothers campaign. So we've been doing this PSA um, using different TV stations <coughs> to encourage the public to eat local and buy local. We do grants and contract management a lot. Uh, we get funding from um, federal government for example, we have a specialty crop block grant program, which is uh, we get $400,000 annually, and then we divide it to a uh, great project um, to increase the ag production. And we also have a sponsorship product promotion funds. Uh, this is uh, designed to help uh, commodity groups and nonprofit organization. <laughs> And after we select the projects to fund, we do the contract management. And we do manage like a 20 to 30 contracts uh, annually. So that not, we, as a government, we cannot just give the money to our friends. So we have to uh, monitor the project, how they progress. And if they, there is any challenge, we, we have to help them out. And outreach and education. Thank you, um, Rob, for inviting me today. Uh, any possibility, we would like to reach out the public and uh, notify what we are doing. There are many benefits you want to know. So we do the outreach and education. In January, we do the uh, specialty crop block grant program, <laughs> how to apply this uh, uh, funding, <coughs> including eligibility and uh, the application process in January. We're going to do uh, state, statewide. That's <coughs> basic um, role as a market developer branch at state. We also work with other Western United States Department of Agriculture 
including California, Oregon, Washington. Uh, we do activities under Western United States Agricultural Trade Association called USATA. Um, <clears throat> we do export activities such as trade shows. We have USATA pavilion. It's a little bit bigger than state pavilion. So we subsidize uh, some trade show uh, booth cost. And all we have like a USA pavilion lounge you can use. That kind of trade show we do manage. And we do inbound missions and outbound missions. Inbound missions means we bring foreign buyers to our state so that you don't have to travel to the market, but you can meet the pre-qualified buyers from the, those foreign countries. Some, sorry, sometimes those meetings are in here. Yes, all the time we use this location because it's free and it's a very central location. Even neighbor island companies uh, come to here, it's easy to do so. Um, so we are planning some inbound missions. Later in this presentation, I'm gonna um, let you know. Also we have uh, outbound mission. Outbound trade mission is the opposite side. We're gonna bring suppliers from the US to the foreign countries then you're gonna meet the potential importers and buyers in their market. That includes market briefing uh, by the USDA officials, and we usually do the uh, retail tour or facility tour to understand the market very well. So uh, our mission is pretty popular activity, and we plan to do some countries uh, uh, we'll be managing. Uh, 2019. USDA also uh, doing the for foreign trade Alba mission. It's like a Alba mission, same thing, but um, they are planning to do the seven Alba mission uh, 2019. So that was my kind of introduction, and um, now I would like to ask who is currently exporting can you raise your hand? Oh, of course, thank you. So others, I assume you are thinking of exporting, right? Okay, <clears throat> so before you export, it's very important your product, your brand has to be recognized in the local market. Nowadays, the buyers around the glo globe, they, they're gonna do a search, research, and using internet and social media, if you are invisible in the local market, I don't think you are ready to do it. So um, please do build your brand uh, recognition in uh, Hawaii and the US first. <clears throat> also that desktop research is the must. Um, it, you know, like any other project, preparation is everything before you export. And today I'm gonna to talk about regulations and some import documentation. Those things are all available in the internet. Um, not, it's not my knowledge, it's public knowledge. So you can search and you can learn. And I really recommend you to do the desktop research on your own. If you think about those uh, sales and marketing, local market, and those research, do you really have a resources to do that? You have enough people to sell your products in a local market or national market. Do you have any financial capability to invest your money? And can you develop your business plan to even get the finance? And it comes to the short-term and long-term goals. So how long does it take to find an importer for you? That's a key, it's a very key. Importer will be, um, importer is not your customer. They are the partner in the other country. And to build a trust and the relationship, you really have, uh, it's, it takes time and efforts to do that. So that's something I wanted to um, point out before I go to my slides. 
Let's look at this flowchart. I tried to find the simplest flowchart of the Japan distribution. <clears throat> this is, I just wanted to give you an, I, an idea. You are exporter and you ship the goods. First, uh, you have to get customs clearance. And the customs clearance is one big thing. So that's why you see the arrow uh, to the left. I'm going to explain the other slide. So after you clear the customs, importer finally get the, your products. After that, they're going to ship to the manufacturer or distributor first, and they're going to go another distributor, second distributor, and they go to the retailer. And then <clears throat> finally, your products will be in the shelf, but you don't know uh, customers really <clears throat> buy your product. That's the another Japan marketing strategy you have to think about it. And if you go <clears throat> to the other side, it's, it's a retail distribution, but if your importer uh, try to sell your products to the food service industry, they have to go to different distributor. And that importer has to do a lot of job for your products. That's why I want you to consider importers are your partner, not the customer. Your customers, it's way later. Okay, next, please. Is it fair to say that even though this is Japan specific, mm -hmm. that you could use rough this rough model in Korea or Mexico? I would say so. Roughly. Yeah, roughly. There would be some small changes. Mm -hmm. And Japan customs clearance, I know it's a very small font. Um, it's just a. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, <clears throat> importer even has to contact with the custom broker. Um, that's a different agency. They are spe uh, spe specifically working to clear the customs. And then the customs role, I'm going to explain a little bit later, but they, they're going to exam examine everything. Document, documents have to be perfectly uh, everything. If there's any documentation is lacking, then they're going to reject or uh, customer broker is going to notify importer and the importer is going to notify the exporter you. So we need this document today. And if that was Friday and if you cannot provide the documentation Friday, it's going to be the next week uh, they're going to re-examine your documentation which is going to cost you the st storage fee <clears throat> in the custom. So um, they're going to do examine the shipment as well. Um, and then sometimes they do physical inspection. Sometimes they don't. If you are a first time shipper, may, most likely they're going to open up and then look at your shipment. So and if it's rejected, they they might discard your shipment. So um, before you go through this, uh, it's very important to have a perfect document uh, on your side. So now I'm going to talk, talk about some regulations and um, documentations. I really help, uh, hope this is going to help you to understand the concept of the export. From here, um, I want you to think about the other side. You're going to be importing the foreign goods to your country. And if you understand why they have to do it under what kind of law, maybe it's, it's going to be easy because um, importers are the ones to tell you, oh, we need this documentation, this and this form, and you just have to follow, but if you conceptually understand why uh, you have to do this, maybe it gets easier for you, I hope. <coughs> the first government agency um, you, we, you're going to deal with is Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries. These are like a USDA, and their role is to help Japan ag industry, not other countries. So their primary role is to protect the ag industry. That's why uh, animal and plant quarantine laws, they administer. Japan agriculture standards law, they 
administer. So they don't want to um, import some pest or disease and then <clears throat> from, from other countries' shipment. And if their plants or agriculture products got infected, they cannot protect their agri industry. So that's why they really want to protect their plants and crops. So um, it's their very similar role uh, to USDA APHIS. So when you do export, uh, you, you deal with them, right? So Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. That's MAFA, and they have, um, they have many uh, laws to <coughs> protect their agri industry. So next agency, um, they do the regulate your export is Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare. MHLW, their job is uh, protect uh, their people in Japan. So they have to regulate whatever the human consume, um, food or be beverage. That's why they want to assure the quality. Everything has to be safe. So they administer food safety basic law, <clears throat> food sanitation law. And food sanitation law includes standards for foods, additives, food containers, and packages, including labeling. So whatever you eat, I mean, they, they have to be sure it's safe. Um, if you add some coloring or flavor here, but if the Japan government don't allow to use that, you have to change the formula to to be approved by MHLW. And <clears throat> those are all um, listing and you, you know what, what you have to avoid. So you have to do the old studies. And also the labeling is another big thing to be, you have to be compliant. That's why they have now um, different agency, the child agency called the Consumer Affairs Consumer Affairs Agency. They administer the labeling laws <clears throat> because now there's not the uh, expiration date is not, not enough. You have to have um, good to eat or, or date or something like that. Um, and good, good to sell the last day, some, something. Yeah, those dates um, sh should be asked. And organic label or GMO, GMO labeling, those um, labeling compliance are required. And in Japanese language, if you sell in the retail. That's um, labeling. And uh, next one is <coughs> Japan customs. <coughs> As I said, Japan custom is the last point to get into Japan. So <clears throat> actually the MHLW and MAFF, those um, regulations you have to prepare before the export. Uh, you have to have all the documents and then cleared with them uh, just before you are imported, uh, before you export your products. But this uh, Japan customs, you have to deal with at the event of uh, export. I mean, for them, the, uh, at time of importation of the goods. Uh, <clears throat> like US, we have our agency's name is Customs and Borders Protection. They have, their, their role is to protect people and the land. So <clears throat> they don't want to um, find weapon in the rice container. So they have to examine all the sh shipment container and documentation. Uh, so they, that's why they have canine unit to look for the, some you know, illegal uh, stuff in your uh, shipment. And also the other important uh, role for the Japan customs is to collect duties. So the revenue from the duties 
is a big part of the country's revenue. Therefore, um, U.S. government has some free trade agreement with some other countries, and that's going to be really beneficial for exporters because you don't have to add these duties to uh, your uh, product. So those are the agencies um, that you keep in your mind when you prepare the doc documentation. And um, let's move to the import documentations. Basically, four documents you might uh, prepare before the import, uh, before export. Notification form for importation of foods and documents showing the ingredients, additives, and manufacturing process. That's for the processed food. And <clears throat> sanitary and health certificate, self-inspection results. The, the, those inspection results uh, by the processed food or, uh, laboratory, those are um, voluntary, but actually mandatory. So there are some gray areas, but importers will tell you those you have to prepare. Therefore, if you decide to do import, uh, start early and <coughs> get those uh, documents <coughs> maybe two months, three months before your uh, export. And other documents, <coughs> uh, those should be go along with your shipment. Invoice, bill of lading or LA bill, uh, insurance certificate, freight account, packing list, and other, other documents like a permit certificate of origin, etc. That those uh, list is varies depending on your products. And usually before you ship uh, to your importer, you have those um, documents ready and you just fax an email to the importer and they're gonna check with the um, agency and if it's okay, um, you get uh, pre-approval from in your importer, then ship. Still, you know, um, at the custom, sometimes the, they requir requir require a different uh, document, but whatever you have, the certificate, um, you should uh, send, send them with the uh, cargo that, that's gonna help. And uh, some categories like, um, the next slide please. Some uh, categories of products require different specific documentation for meat and meat products. <clears throat> from the US to Japan, you need a certificate to export to Japan and meat and poly export certificates of wholesomeness. Those are the uh, results of BSE. Uh, it happened decades ago. Now Japan only allows US beef. Uh, the cow was uh, 30 months or younger. And then the slaughter facility has to be certified, inspected and certified by the USDA. Only facility, uh, uh, and then you have that document along with your beef products. Unfortunately, uh, there is no facili meat facility certified for this purpose in Hawaii. <clears throat> and I hope, um, but beef industry is growing in Hawaii and hopefully we can get one or two uh, in the future, that's my hope. And for fresh fruits and vegetables, <coughs> uh, there is a certificate called uh, phytosanitary certificate that um, <coughs> it should be issued by the Department of Agriculture. And if it's frozen fruits and vegetables, uh, besides the phyto, you have to add other export certificate. And most of the categories go to this processed food category. Um, and because it's not a single ingredient, uh, for example, if you have cookies, um, 
you have your products has to be um, tested uh, by the MHLW registered laboratory in Japan or in the U.S. There is a USDA uh, certified laboratory, and <clears throat> you get tested, and you have to have the record with uh, your document. And usually, those uh, approval process has to be happened before your shipment. And yeah, this uh, uh, manufacturing process is a flowchart of your manufacturer, how you add here, what, and then what kind of hazards you have. So that's, that's a requirement for the most of the processed food. So I hope you understand how, what importers have to do. So they have to know each uh, um, uh, food and beverage <coughs> requires what kind of uh, documents. So, and then they have to tell you what you have to prepare and what they have to do in Japan. And then <coughs> they have to sell your products to a uh, distributor or food service. And <coughs> they have to do the same presentation like you have to do to your sales uh, um, in local market. <coughs> so that's why it takes time. Um, usually um, we ask, I mean, Japanese importers ask you, what is your shelf life? Uh, the minimum shelf life is 12 months because it's gonna be sitting their warehouse and could be distributor's warehouse another month and then in the shelf for you know, another month. And when um, your customer <coughs> take your product and look at the expiration date, if it's only left like a two months. They think it's not fresh. So that, those are, that's the reason behind the shelf life, you know, 12 months or longer is desirable. So how do you find that best possible importer, your partner in the other country? Um, <clears throat> That's why uh, USDA, HDOA, we try to um, provide the opportunity to participate international trade shows and conduct inbound missions, bringing buyers to our state, or outbound missions to take you to the destination market. Also, there is a consulting services, <coughs> Gold Key Service is one of them, or FAS, uh, USDA has a post um, agent. Um, they, they can provide some importer names if you ask. Some countries don't do that anymore uh, because of their like confidentiality uh, law in that. But um, even though you use consulting service, I really believe that face-to-face communication is necessary to before you uh, sign the agreement. Okay, so uh, this is the list of activities we are planning 2019. Foodix Japan Trade Show, March 4 to 8, 2019. Foodix Japan Trade Show is the largest food and beverage trade show in Asia. So as far as uh, I know, we've been going to this trade show with maybe 10 Hawaii ag and food companies uh, the last 10 years. <coughs> uh, the results is great because it attracts more than 80,000 food importers and buyers from Asia uh, attending. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry to interrupt. What's the percentage of people people that attend from Japan compared to outside Japan? The percentage, I don't have exact percentage, but um, the, the booth itself is, oh, there's a domestic hall, mm -hmm. like uh, from Japan, Osaka, Kyoto, those uh, producers uh, will be in the domestic hall. And there's an international pavilion. The international pavilion is, uh, 
almost every country, France has a big pavilion, uh, US, China, um, even Middle East, uh, Spain, they have a Those lot of hands. Buyers from yes. Korea, and then the buyers, um, the top uh, international buyers uh, com country is from Korea. Korea has uh, many countries, and um, Singapore, Thailand, we see many Asian buyers. But we also met uh, buyers from Dubai, you know, Europe, they are coming. I would say maybe 10 to 20%. It's pretty big number, uh, the buyers from outside of the world, uh, outside of Japan. Sorry to ask another question. What Please. types of companies from Hawaii go to the pavilion? Like what's the, is it processed foods or vegetables or what's the mix? Yes. So we have <laughs> Mavi Gold <coughs> Pineapple. Um, they've been with us uh, maybe five, six years. He's gonna share with you uh, his success story from Food X Show. And also we have Hawaiian Chip Company. He's, he featured the products, uh, chips and barbecue sauce. <coughs> the pro those are, so we have like uh, mixed uh, products, fresh, and frozen pineapple and those chips, right? Of course, we have coffee all, all the time. Every year we sell the coffee at the trade show. Macadamia nuts, those are top two um, US, um, I mean, the agriculture products from Hawaii <coughs> to Japan. Also, we have some alcohol beverages, um, the Pau Voka made from Maui Gold and Kola Ram. Um, we have some taro products Usually, uh, I, I think 80% um, is processed food because it's more feasible to export from Hawaii to Japan. But we have fresh produce, including pineapple, Maui onion, hearts of palm. Uh, we had uh, sea asparagus, yeah, aquaculture. Those are the- How about honey? Hawaii has a lot Honey, of yes, we, we have success stories of honey. <clears throat> yeah, that's a Foodex Japan trade show, and if you are interested in participate in uh, Hawaii Pavilion, part of the Hawaii team, please go to our website, hdoa.hawaii.gov slash add slash mdoa. You, you just see me after this I'll presentation. I'll bring it up later when yeah. I can yeah. the PDF. Deadline to submit your uh, application is the end of this month. After this month, I may not be able to uh, include you in the Hawaii Pavilion because it's a popular show and our contractor in Japan has to work on the layout of our booth. Where, where is food at? Makuhari Mese Chiba. It's um, like a, about our train ride from Metropolitan about Tokyo. Halfway between Tokyo proper and Narita Airport. That's, that's correct. Not yes. far from Tokyo, Disneyland. Yeah. Because train system, yes. Um, when products made from ag locally grown agricultural uh, crops are made, for example, like what, if hemp ever comes in, you know, that they make fabric from that, would it be sold in this, you know, through this avenue also, or does it go another avenue? Could oh, this, this show? Hemp? Just through, yeah. Fibers? Hemp. Yeah, they make, make fabric. Yeah, yeah. Hemp. Hemp. Yeah. Strong. Hemp. yeah, hemp is uh, now, I, I think uh, many states are trying to recognize hemp as a USDA. Uh, it, it will go through this. Agriculture, right? Yes. Uh, we, I think uh, HDOA is just uh, starting pilot program. Um, we are, uh, I don't think there's uh, finished product made in Hawaii yet, yeah. But eventually it might be added to uh, one of the agriculture products. And then, they, of course, th they are entitled to be in the Hawaii Pavilion. But particularly a food show, I don't think, uh, unless they have a supplement or anything. Egg would cover, Hawaii egg would cover other things that are made from agricultural products and that they want to sell Okay, so at, at this moment, we 
kind of focusing focusing on the food um, pavilion because we have more food companies uh, than um, those textile companies made by uh, Hawaii, uh, made in Hawaii things, um, the agricultural products. So if we have more products um, growing in Hawaii and made in Hawaii, uh, the hemp is one of them. Uh, I know there is uh, one guy who is growing indigo and he wants to grow even uh, silk. And if <laughs> when, when he, you know, make a finished product and uh, that sector, they are still agriculture and that sector is growing and more beneficiaries um, are increasing, then we can use our fund, state fund, to support that sector. But right now, I think food is the majority sector for the agriculture. Oh, we have a, if you go to our uh, HDO website, uh, there is a contact information I can share with you. Another uh, foreign importers who encourage the propagation of particular plants in Hawaii for the purpose of exporting it uh, as there's a market? What kind of plants? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Anything in particular? You know, do they say, well, you know, I don't have any use for this now, or I have a use for this now that you do have, but how about this, you know, uh, other type of plant? Yeah, well, well like, uh, we, we have a, um, like a Hawaii Tropical Fruit Growers Association. They, they try to get seed or seedling from other countries and then try to, like, uh, test which variety yes. is going to be, you know, in Hawaii. growing Hawaii well, and then... After they do testing, and they're gonna share the seedling to the farmers to grow and make it. Uh, you know, yeah. I'm sorry to stay on this point of food X, but I think it's important to talk about because we have another um, seminar later in 2019 just on trade shows and how to uh, prepare for an international trade show, what to do while you're at the trade show, and then how to follow up after close uh, some of those contracts. But my, my question would be, roughly, if a company from Hawaii wants to join the Foodex Pavilion, what does that cost them to join? To cost to join for 2019, we have two different uh, category. One is for the company who has already in-country importer, and that, that in-country uh, importer is gonna represent your products. So showcasing the product in the shared space. That would be $500. Or you're gonna have designated space, which is gonna be roughly 70 square foot. <laughs> it's usually uh, one, one booth, is um, 10 by 10, right, 100 square foot. But Foodex is a little bit smaller, one booth is, I guess, a little bit smaller than 10 by 10. And we cannot give one probably, full booth. Probably three, yeah. yeah, I cannot give one full booth to 10 companies. So it depends on the participation, but we're gonna charge $1,000 for the, those, a little over half booth space and then you are required to be manning the booth. Most companies, if they have an importer, do they still go and help with the Some, some they do, because that's gonna help. Um, so the, the company already have importer means you're not looking for importers, right? So um, if you are new to the market, you have to look for the importer, your partner, to do the sales job in the country. But if you already have an importer, you're gonna sell, you, the purpose of the participation in the Foodex is to reach out the, the next layer of your customer, which could be hotel, 
which could be restaurant, which could be retailer, like a Eon or a big name supermarket. So then you have to think about how to present your products at the Foodex. If you are looking for the food service industry, if you bring macadamia nuts, a jar of macadamia, it's not gonna sell. You have to be creative. So you make a dish, uh, pancake with the macadamia nut sauce, and sprinkle the dice of macadamia. That's how you present. That's how, that, that's how you sell. That, that kind of marketing strategy will be needed. But nonetheless, uh, $500 or $1,000 is still a really good Really a good deal, and we may raise this price you know, eventually because other trade shows, uh, you saw the leaflet. Uh, we have National Restaurant Association trade show in Chicago. That's a food service uh, trade show in the Midwest and <clears throat> and East North Northeast market. If you want to go to that route, we have a Hawaii Pavilion. One booth uh, costs thirty-six hundred dollars. Uh, HDO is going to subsidize um, half, fifty percent, which means company has to pay eighteen hundred dollars. And PMA show, Produce Marketing Association trade show in Anaheim in October. This is for the fresh producers, and also we charge seventeen hundred to eighteen hundred per booth. So Foodex is. I think because we really want to um, expand and support uh, Hawaii companies in the Japan market, and the Foodex show is getting a legacy show for the HDOA, we would like to m maintain our presence in the trade show and um, hopefully the more company can participate. Yeah. I'm sorry to stay no. on the point for so long. Please continue. Okay. So that's a uh, state uh, managed trade shows in 2019. I said Foodex National Restaurant Association show and PMA. We have USADA missions um, earlier. I, I said two inbound missions from Canada and from Korea. If you sign up, uh, you will be able to meet Korean buyers and Canada buyers. Again, these cost like. Twenty dollars, usually twenty dollars to cover some refreshment. Very that's reasonable. yeah, that's it. And we'll be managing our missions to Korea and Taiwan. The dates will be September 30th to October 2nd. We go to Korea and travel to Taipei, and then continue to Taiwan Alba mission. Or you can just uh, choose either one of them, and then. You can do your own thing. So that's the activities we are thinking of doing. How could a neighbor island company take part in this? Would they, can they fly here, or do any of these missions go to Maui or the Bay? Good question. We would love to do the neighbor island mission in inbound. The thing is, we in the past, we had a difficult time to recruit companies to participate in the neighbor island. Therefore, we always end up doing uh, the mission in Honolulu. But uh, Canada inbound mission is going to be focusing on nursery uh, cut flower and the fresh produce. And we are planning to go to Big Island this year. Yeah. Thank you. So, be yes. That's about the Korea outbound mission. Is that going to be tied to a trade show in Korea, or what, what, what's that going to involve? So Just this uh, this outbound trade mission is not going to be tied with trade show. Uh, it's solely to meet one-on-one um, -on -one meetings. The contractor is going to set up maybe 10 to 20 meetings in two days, and you're going to have a real discussion with the Potential. Will it include a overview of Korea? I mean, or at least a tour of Seoul yeah. or anything. It's like going to be Seoul because Seoul is like um, the Korea, South Korea is very small, and the Seoul is very central. It's everything centralized, and we only go to Seoul. And 
if there is uh, any trade show uh, during that time, we might visit, but I, I'm not sure at this moment if there is a trade show at this time. And we do the market tour, of course. So I would like to talk about a little bit about Korea market. Um, Japan is great for the Hawaii companies, but in case something happened in Japan, earthquake, well, I don't, I don't want to say a bad thing, but uh, if one market is not working, then if you have excess production of your products, you have to, maybe it's, it's a good idea to look for another market. And I would say Korea is pretty, um, reasonable. Um, Korea is the fifth largest export market for the U.S. agriculture. And we have a free trade agreement with Korea called Chorus. So most of the agriculture products tariffs are zero to maybe really low. So that's beneficial for you. And <laughs> regulations import Regulations are very similar. Uh, the standards are very high. Um, once you clear the Japan standards, it's going to be very similar practice you can do. And even demographics are pretty similar. Um, they are very hardworking people, and they have less child, and <coughs> they are aging their population is aging. Therefore, they are looking for healthy, functional food. They are very conscious about their health. So if you develop some kind of healthy snack, you might uh, look for the Korea too. And Korea always love the coffee, so it's good for the uh, coffee industry, as well as macadamia nuts. <clears throat> One thing very different uh, from Japan and Korea, from my ob observation, I don't want to be stere stereotyped, but uh, the personality is different. <clears throat> Korea people tend to say yes or no much faster than Japanese. So faster decision making, but you have to be ready to react to their questions. You have to say yes or no now. So, so that's something uh, I wanted to point out. And another market you might be looking at is Canada. <laughs> Canada is the largest export market for U.S. agriculture. Uh, we just uh, agreed to extend NAFTA trade agreement along with Mexico. Uh, it's gonna take time to implementation, but uh, that's a good sign. And <coughs> we, share with common culture, language, lifestyle. Of course, uh, it's next to us, <clears throat> I mean for the mainland. Language, um, we can talk in English, except the labeling. If you export processed products to Canada, your li label has to be in French as well. That's a requirement. Another good thing is there are many non-stop flights from every island. If you produce coffee from Big Island, you can ship to ship from Big Island to Canada, no problem. You don't have to come to Honolulu. Because of the diverse population, their demand of the ethnic food is huge. They're looking for kimchi, they're looking for, you know, like uh, Vietnamese uh, f uh, spices, what Thai spices, herbs. And because of that severe climate, they are importing a lot of fresh produce and fruits, vegetables. There's a big chance. Also the benefit is they are okay for GMO. They import a lot of papayas from us. And <clears throat> they're gonna, their climate is gonna kill the pests, so we don't have to do the heat treatment treatment for those fresh produce. <laughs> those are good things, and one thing concerns maybe you will be um, their importer broker role is a little bit different from Asian importers. 
Asian importers, Korea importers, they would like to take care of everything on your behalf. But <clears throat> Canada importers, <clears throat> they're gonna ask retainer fee. Okay, I'm gonna represent, represent your products, but I need $3,000 a month as a retainer fee. Then I'm gonna work, I'm gonna reach out to sales. So it's just a custom thing. And um, because they have such a big land, so they have to reach out, uh, they have to travel. So maybe that's, that's something you have to be aware. Okay, so these are my uh, presentation. Now, if you have any questions, you can ask me, email me, call me. Please, any questions? I have some online questions. I have a bunch of questions for you, but we'll bring the panel up and we'll talk. Yes, sir. Yes. For the, the Canadian market, is it the GMO is accepted or acceptable? Yes. Would there be any requirement for the labeling of the GMO? Oh, the GMO labeling. Mm. I am not aware of that, but I can get the answer. I don't think so, uh, yeah, right now. Anybody else? Okay, I have a, there's some online questions. If you want, you can sit down okay. and relax and have a water. Take your microphone so we can hear you. It's kind of like a... Thank you. Um, okay, here's an online question. I have a winery and whiskey and uh, brandy manufacturer. Does Japan have an interest in importing these kinds of products from Maui? And could the High Step Program or Department of Agriculture help a company like me, an alcohol company? Yes, as long as um, it's sourced uh, agriculture product, agriculture ingredients from Hawaii. We will help you, yeah. And then... You talked about uh, insurance, mm -hmm. and there's a question about um, what specific kind of insurance is required? I think insurance for the your shipment. The shipment insurance. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, here's another one. How are Hawaiian food products typically retailed in Japan? Are they in supermarkets, department stores, or online? Um, do we have any examples of successful Hawaiian products in Japan? Yes, I think that's going to be a great um, question to Jamie. His, his products has been successful in the Japan market. With that, maybe can we bring up the panelists and have a seat up here next to you, Kashi, and we'll just open up questions and talk a bit about your experiences. Are you going to start now? Or? Yeah, oh, okay. okay. All right. Just pass the We have okay. to share one microphone, otherwise it gets to be yeah. feedback. So on the far side here is Jimmy Chan. He's general manager of the Hawaiian Chip Company. You've probably passed their facility on uh, Nimitz and also seen their chips and their um, Kilauea fire sauce all the time. I've been using the spicy sauce of my eggs in the morning. Awesome. You know, awesome. Really good. Oh, it was really good today. And then, um, Rudy Bolala is from Maui Gold Pineapple. Um, obviously, that's a company that has a lot of experience with exporting and what have you. So, um, before I start asking you some questions or we take questions from the floor online, I thought maybe if you could just take 60 seconds and tell everybody about um, a little bit about the company and then your exporting experience and, and um, 
where where do you primarily export to and is there some quick lesson that you could tell everybody that you've learned and maybe share them the pain that you went through and they won't have to go through that okay sure please sure yeah so um <clears throat> like rob said um, i'm jimmy um i uh i started the hawaiian chip company making sweet potato and taro chips about uh about 18 years ago um and then uh basically um we started small, grew from the farmers markets into statewide distribution, um, and uh, you know started trying to sell to the mainland this and that, um, and then we even tried. Um, we started export with um, with help from the Department of Ag, uh, in a booth at the Food Act show, about maybe about ten years ago, and um, and uh, you know we've been trying to crack that market ever since. Um, uh, we've, we've found success, not necessarily in, in stores. You know, we, we, we do see a bunch of other brands in stores. A lot of the bigger companies that you'll recognize like Hawaiian Host, Lion Coffee, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the bigger brands, you know, you'll see in a Japanese grocery store. But, um, for our products, what we found is that, um, we're still growing in Hawaii. So maybe the demand just isn't quite there for our brand name. We're, so we needed to strengthen a lot of our brand in Hawaii. And that's what we're concentrating on now with our own retail store. But what we've been having success in is actually um, restaurant food service to Japan. So we sell in bulk. We're not trying to necessarily sell our name, Hawaiian Chip Company, on a store next to other products priced way cheaper. Um, we're selling as a component of restaurant ingredients, like how Yukashi was talking about presentation at the shows, show how your chips and make some nachos or something, and even my sauces, it's a component of a burger. So instead of selling retail 40% higher than the next comparable product, it's 10% of one product, so the cost to the consumer isn't as obvious when they pass that cost on, that increased cost. So we've been selling a lot of bulk sauce, a lot of bulk chips, and that's that's just the biggest component of our retail. And um, and right now, again, um, we want to crack the retail market at some point, but that's a long-term thing. Right now, we're still trying to make sure that tourists find out about our products in Hawaii so that we eventually build that demand. So. Hi, good morning. I'm Rudy Balala from Maui Go Pineapple Company. Um, We've been exporting to Japan for about nine years now. Um, we started off with fresh old fruit, um, doing it small. And as we grew, we, we have started to attend these shows in Japan. And what happened was, you know, they taste your pineapple, you got, then people start looking for it. And what happened was, from selling just fresh pineapple in, in, in Japan, we were approached by bigger companies like Nishimoto Trading Company, who's now Wismatic um, Company. And we also have um, feelers from Inabata Company, which is a new customer that wants to purchase our, our, our value-added stuff. So right now we're also doing some frozen stuff to Japan now, cut fruit. And our next project right now is, is using stuff that we normally don't use, which is like cores and miscut fruit and, and, and stuff like that. And, and this project that we're working on now is not actually shipping it to Japan, but working with a Japan company to ship it to Thailand to be processed. So it, it a lot of interesting stuff comes out of, of attending these shows. And, you know, I, I think we've been successful over the last nine years because of the failures we've had before that. Um, I worked for Maui Land and Pineapple Company for, for quite a while before we started up Halim Ali Pineapple Company. And, and we failed miserably in, in trying to get into the Japan market because we were trying to do it all by ourselves. You know, we wanted to 
handle a product from the time it left Maui all the way to the time it gets, got to Japan, and we, and we botched that all up. So when we, when we started Halimali Pineapple Company, or Maui Gold Pineapple Co- Company, we kind of took a, stu- a step back and, and tried to do it the right way, which was find somebody who knows how to import, find a good freight forwarding company, um, and kind of like wash our hands of, of all the dirty work that needs to be done. I mean, definitely there's a lot of work that you have to do, but if you can find somebody knowledgeable on that, on when it leaves your place, all the way to the time it gets to Japan, to the time it gets to the final customer, it makes your job a lot easier. Um, you know, so now, because we, 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 we worked on it before we, 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 we succeeded, you know, it, it's pretty much get an order, get the stuff ready, get all of your paperwork ready, and you're done. So it, it's most important, get all of your ducks in a row before you guys even attempt to try and do this kind of stuff. Thank Sorry, you. it's longer than no. 60 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a quick online question here directly to Jimmy. Is the main reason for restaurants to incorporate your chips in their menu is so that they can put one Hawaiian taro or sweet potato on their menu? Or do you have a feeling for why, why you're successful with those restaurants? <clears throat> um, yeah, I think I think I think in part it is to legitimize, you know, their um, you know um, their capacity to call their menu items um, Hawaiian, um, you know, uh, um, with the with the chips. Um, I'm I'm not not specifically sure what quantity each menu item is using them, um, but for the sauces, I can say that um, that uh, that. The, one of the burger companies that uses our sauce features it on an Oahu burger every summer. And, uh, and they, one of the things is they have to insist that the sauce be made in Hawaii. Um, and, uh, so yes, that, that is part of the component. And, um, and I think, um, I think that that kind of is our, our selling point and that's how we justify, um, our higher price point too. That's great. That's a good segue because, um, as you've heard me talk many times, if you, particularly if you've heard me talk about the in the marketing seminars where I preach very hard to the local companies that we consult to on building up your marketing so that you are marketing the made with aloha, whether that's a, a, a manufactured good such as clothes that are made in Hawaii or candles that are made in Hawaii or towels or whatever you're manufacturing, we try to get our companies to really upsell the part about made in Hawaii. And I think with the agricultural products, it's equal or maybe even more important because what these customers are wanting to buy is the naturalness that comes with being made in Hawaii, right? And I. Many of you have probably heard me say this before, but I'll say it again anyway, because I think it's an important point. Hawaii, the word Hawaii, the state of Hawaii, is out in the world marketing for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Hawaii is a positive word around the world, right? Made in Hawaii, made with aloha. That is everywhere you go in the world when you see that written down or you hear the word Hawaii, it brings a smile to somebody's face, right? And our companies here really need to market that incredibly strongly. So I use the example as there is a place in the world called Transylvania. And people in Transylvania are making products and they're selling products out into the world. But when you're a consumer and you hear that word made in Transylvania, what, I mean, what is the first thing that comes to mind? It's not beaches and palm trees and sway and hula and all of this other stuff, right? Those people have a significant problem when they're starting their marketing plan. But our companies here have 
such an advantage, and we really have to play that up and take it to the extreme. And I think for the agricultural products, it's even more so because when you think about agriculture, you think about you think about the soil and the sun and the water. And what's better than products made in such a beautiful place than Hawaii, right? And we really need to turn that up. So I think you're probably right on the key that if a company in Japan is buying your chips to legitimize their Hawaiian menu, uh, perfect, right? So well, be it. And, uh, you know, I also think that, you know, part of the concern may come in that, okay, if they're using just one chip per item or whatever, it seems like a small volume. And with my sauce, they're actually mixing it with another salsa. So it's less than 5% of the product, the actual product. But in Japan, you're looking at, you know, one chain being 30 restaurants, which is a small chain. And um, they're still buying, you know, over 500 gallons every summer. So through, through um, volume and um, distribution, um, you're able to overcome, you know, because that's more sauce than I sell in Hawaii. So during that same period. When you yeah. ship that, do you ship that by air or by ocean? Um, it's, 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 it should be shipped by ocean. Um, sometimes we get some last minute orders, so they do get shipped by air, but our importer um, uh, has to cover that cost. Yeah. So. Um, okay, so a lot of people will come to us for advice on testing, let's say in Japan, but it would be the same if you were shipping it to some other country. You'd probably have to get it tested by their version of the FDA or whatever. So let's just stick with Japan because we've been talking about that. You have, that I know of, two different flavors of the of recipes for the sauce. Did you have to get both of those tested? How does that work? Like if a company, say, they make jam, and you have a strawberry jam, and you have a mango jam, and a papaya jam, and do each of those have to be tested individually? Um, so, so they they do um, they do perform uh, their own uh, independent tests um, on on the products coming in. But what what I what I had to do was actually provide um, a specific ingredient list, um, breaking down the exact percentages of all the products going into it. Um, and this can be kind of uh, kind of a hassle because we had to um, even um, even our our barbecue seasoning, which is a small component of our sauce has um, paprika in it, which has silicone dioxide, which is considered a natural agent to keep um, things free-flowing in powders. Um, but the Japan, um, when we submitted our ingredient list, they, they wanted to know how big the silicone dioxide particles are. And trying to get that information from a company is just, you know. And, and luckily, I, I played soccer with the, um, the senior scientist at some national company, and he was able to get that for me, thank God. But I, I really, you know, it, it's, it, it does, um, it does create, create some challenges um, in that sense. And then you also have to submit your, your process, the process, like how exactly how you make the product. And that can be a little unnerving for some people, right? You got the secret recipe, you don't want to give it out, right? But, um, you know, I kind of, for me, I, I approach it like, you know, any skilled chef can pick apart, you know, you eat a cake and the skilled chef can pick apart what's in it and, and figure out how to cook it. And, you know, it's no, it's no different from my products. I mean, even for the chips, right? You slice vegetables, then put it in hot oil, take it out when it's crunchy. That's, you know, that's pretty much it, so. Um, so I've, I've become comfortable with sharing those things, um, and um, that's just what, what you need to do to get in. Yes? I guess back to adding, because most of your, your byproduct or your, that supports your business comes mostly from Hawaiian soil, correct? Um, <clears throat> on the, um, for, the, for the chips, um, yeah, uh, uh, the sweet potato is... Um, is primarily grown in Hawaii. Is in fact all all the Okinawan sweet potato that we use is grown in Hawaii. Yeah, because I, I, I my experience with Japan that they, they go to the minute factors of what is inside, like magnesium, potassium, calcium, you know, phosphates that is even in the soils, 
that ends up in the product, like even it's the pineapple. Same thing yeah. with um, agricultural products. Also, you gotta give them a list of, of stuff that you use, and they'll 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 you you can give them the list, but they'll double check it in, in Japan. Um, and and same thing like Jimmy said with the process. You know, they'll come in. They'll for us. They actually came in and visited us, and went with us through the whole process to make sure that we weren't making up a story. So it, it's kind of interesting. When they do that, you build up trust with, with everybody. And, and in Japan, I think that is probably one of the most important things. You gotta trust them and they gotta trust you. Yeah. And, and if, if all of that works, it, it's not a hard thing to do. I've consulted to dozens of companies over the years trying to get them into different countries. And particularly Japan, and I don't believe that the Japanese authorities are trying to exclude you. They're just trying to under, I believe they're trying to make sure that your processes are predictable and repeatable. It's almost from an engineering standpoint. If you're growing it or you're making it, they just want to make sure that if you're making something in January and you make it again in June, it's going to be exactly the same thing, right? That's my experience with that. But my, my experience that I would share, I think Jimmy alluded to it a little bit. If you have suppliers whose materials are going into your product, you need to get your suppliers, your supply chain on board with the documentation that you're going to submit. I've seen this before with sort of non-agricultural products too, when we've tried to get some shampoos or uh, creams and sunscreens and this like this approved, that it could be very pure. It, it could be fantastically pure product, but some of those, the chemicals that are in that product, you don't control and you bought it from somebody else and it's going to show up on the spectrograph when it's read in Japan, and they're going to tell you that, oh, you have, in this case, what, silicon dioxide at 10 parts per million. You didn't list that on your form. Why do you have that in there? And you can't answer that question. Only your supplier of that chemical can answer that question. And so you, you need to really get all of those people on board and understand, explain to them, hey, we're going to try to take this product to Japan, we're going to be tested. Your product is um, in it, is in the mix, and so we're going to be coming to you looking for this documentation. And this, the more that you have your supply chain on board with you, the easier it's going to make your life later on when you're getting the products tested. Is that a fair statement? Yep. Okay. Please. Did, did you require an MSDS? Um, they didn't necessarily ask for that, um, and, and, you know, basically they, they have, they have their list of, of, st of chemicals that they can use, so they've got all of that information, and, you know, I had one incident where they had the list of everything we used, and we were testing a different product um, as a um, post-harvest treatment for the fruit, where we changed the wax up, and they found it. <laughs> they let it go, but they found it. But I had to give. Then I had to give them all of the documentation on the on the on the product. But they they, they have this list of everything they're going to accept, and if 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 there is something that's not on their list. Um, and they find it, they'll call you for it. Um, so, so they're very thorough. And uh, if you get to the Japanese market, they're the hardest part, but when you get in there, you pretty much get to the market. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that 100%. I mean, even on their food safety. Um, you know, we, we, in, in the United States, you gotta do all of your food safety audits. You gotta do your primus, you gotta get your FISMA, you gotta have your HACCP. Our Japan customers has never asked us for it. They actually come down and, and they spend a week with you um, as you're um, 
doing a product and they won't accept it until, they won't even let you produce for them until they give you the green light. So, so it, it's kind of a, they want to make sure for themselves that they can, you, you can do it correctly before they will even let you ship to them. So that, that is what happened with our frozen stuff. In a way though, that's a great, a great aspect of Hawaii is relatively low cost and it's no secret that uh, Japanese people are looking for a reason to visit Hawaii. So for them to come and check out your facility or check out your, that's great. Now, if he was selling a product from, I don't know, Florida, would it be that easy for, or would a, a Japanese company be that eager to come to Florida and check that out? Probably not. So being in Hawaii, I think, is a benefit in that regard to selling to Japan and other parts of Asia. There's a, an online question here um, for either speaker. What kind of average increased profit margin do made in Hawaii products realize in markets like Japan uh, versus say selling only in Hawaii? Do you have any? <sighs> I'm, not a, I'm not ashamed to say this, but you, the way we set up our market is, is we sell FOB, our facility that that's how we set it up and and, and uh, the importer will bring in we'll pay for everything else he'll pay for the final sanitary for the shipping um, customs uh, and whatever else cost there are but by the time we sell it to the time it hits the market from the time we're into the catalogs and stuff the price is almost quadrupled yeah and and that is that is that, <laughs> that is that is the that is that that thing that got stuck in our head when we were at Maui Land and Pine. We saw that, we saw that you can sell something for say ten bucks and make forty, fifty bucks when you get to Japan, but we didn't realize everything in between. So we learned a lot from that. So so when we got we got an opportunity to to start um, shipping to Japan with. Um, Halimari Pineapple Company, we made sure that all of that stuff was covered by somebody. So, so you know, you, there's a lot of stuff in between that, that you don't know about before you start importing, so exporting to Japan, so. Another kind of a follow-on question is, um, if you were just using a distributor, maybe not one that's such a full-service distributor, but how much uh, marketing in market in Japan, do you help with, or is it sort of fire and forget? Like they do everything, you just pull the trigger and then it happens. Or do you go and help them with their marketing of your products? Um, for 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 the pineapple, we the way we help them out is we attend the shows. We I I, I think I've attended. Whew, at least I think all of all of the deal, <coughs> Department of Ag stuff in Japan. And I think with DBED, I think at least six years of it. And, and we help in that way. Um, for the fresh hole, we have our importer do all of the um, marketing. He'll do all our catalogs, he'll do all our print work for, for the fresh hole. For, for um, the value added stuff, when we work with Nishimoto or, or Inabata, they will they will actually go out and find somebody to contract with. So, for example, the first time we went heavy on the, on the frozen stuff to Japan, it was with Moss Burger in Japan. And Moss Burger has thousands of stores throughout Japan. The second was, one was, uh, was with uh, Mini Stop, one of the convenience stores. And they have thousands of, of um, stores in Japan. And, and what, they, what they did with our stuff was they developed desserts to put on their menu for, for half a year. And what they did, took everything what they needed, and that was it. We didn't have to do any marketing on our side. They, they did that because the percentage of ratio that you cannot actually fulfill the market mm -hmm. yeah. market. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so I mean, that, that's the good part. Um, we'd work with somebody reliable and, and respectable and, and 
established in Japan. They'll tell you exactly what they need, and you fulfill it, it it's, you, you develop that relationship where they come back again. Yeah. Let me just add to that. Um, you know, for for us, I, I I don't I don't speak any Japanese, so yeah. um, it, My it's Japanese. <laughs> but, but so so like Rudy, we we set up at the trade shows, um, you know, and, and support in that sense. Um, try to come up with different presentations. Try to figure out how to reach reach um what see what um catches their attention in terms of presentation, and um, but also try to make make myself available for meetings so that my importer will take us over to, you know, meet with them and, and you know, they, they host, and when they host, they host beautifully, you know. <laughs> it's always a really good meal and, and some drinks and whatever, but, um, but uh, you know, so you just kind of do that because they enjoy that, just that effort on your part, you know. Um, trying to speak a little bit of my Rosetta Stone Japanese <laughs> and, and they appreciate it and, um, you know, part of that. But for, for me, the biggest thing that, that we do in terms of marketing is actually our marketing here in Hawaii, trying to just strengthen our brand. Because again, we're a small company, we're still just trying to get people to recognize it outside of Hawaii. So that's why we try to provide an experience for, for Japanese tourists when they come here that they'll remember. So they, and a lot of the experience that we've cultivated comes from studying the Japanese market on these trade shows and whatnot. And, one of the things that we've seen that the Japanese really value is fresh. I mean, they want that fish still moving, you know? I mean, it's, it's and, and what better way to serve them chips than right off the pro production line, hot and fresh. Give them an experience. Um, we let them season up their own chips at our factory, which, you know, is actually something that was borrowed from Japan. Well, I went into McDonald's and they said, oh, here, take your, take this, fried chicken and add your own seasoning and shake it up in a bag. And I went, wow, what a great concept. And I just translated it to my, co my company here. So what we're doing here is trying to reinforce the brand so that when they go back, the demand for the products will eventually build. Um, and uh, even, even, even so much so that the importer, our importer actually brings customers to Hawaii, like Rob said, it's 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 not a it's not a real it's not a, not a problem to get their arms to twist to come to Hawaii. Yeah. So we we host them here and show them show them around and um, and that seems to help uh, facilitate the relationships as well. That's a great one of the leading questions. It is a great segue. Is how to leverage the market potential from tourists that come here and test your products, try your products, and then how do you take that and expand it back into their home market, right? And I think you talked about it a little, but that's something that in Hawaii we have a great opportunity with something like this coming year, there'll be around 1.8 million tourists coming from Japan. Uh, how do you market to them when they're here locally? So, and then spin that into bigger sales once they get back home, right? How do you have a strategy? Or? Well, um, so for, for us, instead, you know, the initial strategy was to build demand with the stores, with um, the supermarkets, like Rudy mentioned, thousands of minute stops and all this. Um, uh, what, what my importer is actually doing is we're actually shifting our model to cater more, a little bit more to the omiyage market, not quite the traditional omiyage, you know, companies and all that, but more like online, direct, direct to consumer. And and you know what? That's just um, that's how even our buying in the U.S. and Hawaii is changing, right? I mean, you know, through Amazon and whatnot, and um, Japan's got their own. They've got a wonderful delivery system, so we're just capitalizing on that and. Um, Going back to even the question about the margins and the net profits, um, by going direct to consumer, um, at least our importer is able to, you know, maximize a, a little bit more net revenue, um, which makes it worthwhile. So, how much of your production manufacturing stuff that is domestic compared to export to Japan? You know, um, for for my chips, export is less than one one percent of one percent of the sales, um, but I think, you know, like I said, the 
effort to export and what I've added to my company here. Um, since I've started kind of um, visiting Japan and all that, the company has actually tripled in size. Um, and, and I can say that that, that is a direct, um, there's a direct correlation between, you know, testing, testing markets through these trade shows, testing products, um, you know, and then learning new opportunities on how to build experience in Hawaii. So. The next question I had was, what's the price difference between the retail that you sell here out of your store and your, your company compared to what is selling there retail on shelf? So up up on the shelves, um, it's it's at least um, at least double the price. Um, uh, you know, Rudy's Rudy, Rudy's model was was um, is what we're actually following now for our food service, which is just FOB Honolulu. Um, when I first broke into the market and tried to set retail pricing to cushion, you know, from being four times more, I actually gave them a lower price on my retail bottles and my retail bags of chips um, that I was selling. So I was actually taking a lower net margin in hopes that we'd be able to overcome that lower net by doing quantity, but that's where we realized, hey, you know what? Our brand's still not quite that strong yet. We're still in the beginning stages. We got to strengthen our brand. Um, so, so yeah. So, um, hope that answered your question. I think it goes back to, to what I said earlier about the name of the Aloha and the freshness and the Hawaii-ness of all of that. Because the companies that this year are the most successful, here, whether it's an agricultural product or not, it's the product that um, is premium and it can absorb the high, the shipping cost to the foreign market. It can absorb the um, local distribution costs, all of these things so that our companies here in Hawaii that are trying to compete solely on cost or price on the shelf in Japan, we're not gonna have a very good track record. Our companies here really need to focus on being in the premium zone does that make sense so 2x is not unheard of or more and that's just the way it is whether that's soaps again soaps or shampoos towels candles jellies jams honey pineapples chips sauce there's no way you're going to be able to compete with uh, some made in china product or locally made in japan product Um, another question, more of a comment from um, online. There's concern, there's always concern about intellectual property. And particularly when sending to Japan, companies, when they're first learning about exporting to Japan, they suddenly realize, wow, I'm giving my recipe to somebody at the molecular level, not just sort of make you know two cups here and three cups there and a dash of pepper or whatever. I'm really giving them the, the company jewels, if you will. And you said earlier, that's just sort of a, a bullet you had to bite. Can yeah. you elaborate on that and how you felt about that the first time? Because the question here is very particularly about Coca-Cola. When Coca-Cola mm -hmm. was selling into Japan, the Coca-Cola have to give their recipe? And I say, yes, they, they, they must have done that at some yep. point. Yep. Well, um, you know, or to get, to get around it, I mean, you find someone in Japan that can make your product too, which is what I'm sure Coke is doing now. I mean, um, license it. You know, sort of. license it, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, it, 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 it's uncomfortable. I mean, no, no matter what, it's, it's all, it, to me, it's still uncomfortable. I do it. Um, I, I can understand if people would hesitate not, not to do it. I mean, um, you know, if, um, I, again, I guess it really depends on, on what, what the goals of the, the business are and how valuable that, that recipe is to the, to the business. I think, I think for us, um, you know, I, I've always assumed that if my sauce is good enough, um, somebody's going to try to replicate it. Um, and, uh, um, you know, it helps to not make it easier for them. 
Uh, but at the same time, I, I don't doubt that, you know, any, any, any skilled person with a culinary background, I mean, that's what they're teaching in culinary school right now. It's like how to pick apart stuff and how to make products. And, um, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna happen one way or another. And, um, you know, like I said, uh, you know, I guess, uh, if they're trying to copy me, then it means I'm doing something yeah. right. <laughs> and then, uh, it's just like the, uh, the Sriracha guy, you know, the, the guy with the rooster sauce, Right. That's the every, there's there's all kinds of knockoffs and he, he doesn't get bothered by the knockoffs because um, he was first to market. And, uh, you know, for me, that's that's my goal right now. It's being first to market, creating a presence, becoming that identity for being, you know, like um, I kind of see it like Leonard's Malasadas. A lot of people make Malasadas. Right. Um, but they're the they're the brand that the Japanese are, you know, they're, they're lining up for it. Yeah. Tourists, tourists from all over the world are going to Leonard's Malasadas, even though you can get Malasadas at pretty much any other bakery. Um, but um, it's, I think they've built that brand. And for me personally, that's what I'm concentrating on. And I'm not, I'm not too worried about the formula. And I just, like Rudy said, trust. Yeah. I, you know, I trust that their government's not going to be selling selling our recipes on the side or our processes and you know japan takes intellectual property very seriously yeah right so i i i wouldn't think that this is i've never heard of this as an issue in japan yeah and and again just my just experience with the culture itself i mean it's a very respectful culture yeah. i i um i lost i lost my camera in a in a cab and the cab driver drove, drove clear across Tokyo to return it to me and refused to accept a tip. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, anywhere else that would have been gone. I mean, yeah. and. Here's a, uh, kind of an online question, but one that I have too. This would mostly be for Yukashi. Let's say, uh, staying with Japan, going to Food X or maybe another trade show in Japan, a company from Hawaii would like to attend and take some samples. Do those samples have to be tested, or how, how does that work? And do the samples need to be labeled? Oh, the, the label is, um, oh. So for just participating in trade show or uh, giving sample, not for the purpose of selling, you don't have to be have a Japanese label. So it's it's just a sample, so you don't have to. Is there a limitation about how much you can take? Yes, because it's you said it's sample. You are uh, excluded from the certain tariffs, and so you cannot bring twenty cases of beer if you want to sell. <laughs> you know, a sample has to be maybe one case. I mean, th there is no clear definition of how much quantity you can bring as sample, but you will be questioned. <laughs> And then once they, you know, uh, found out, then you're gonna get fined. So you don't wanna go that. So, but most people, let's say they're going to food acts, mm -hmm. would they take it on the plane with them when they're traveling to the show, or do they ship it ahead of time to get it cleared, or how does that work? If you have a importer or somebody, uh, so when you ship means you, there is somebody to receive in the country, and that person has to clear the customs and everything. So I normally suggest bring with you, uh, if you can, uh, especially the alcohol beverages, uh, because I hear many I stories. No, I hear many stories. Um, whenever you bring samples alcohol to the trade show, somewhere, somehow, somewhere, <laughs> it's confiscated. So <laughs> that's why, um, but other things, if you have somebody, uh, well, sometimes, uh, most of the times, trade shows, um, you can ship to them, should be fine. So in the, when you were talking about at FoodX, for example, in oh. the Hawaii Pavilion, there's an option where you have an importer already, or option number two, where you're looking for an importer. <laughs> So in option number two, mm -hmm. who would you ship the product? To? Okay, we have a contractor to take care of uh, the suppliers, exhibitors, including that uh, sample shipment. So you, you would help we the company will, figure 
Yes, we will do help uh, companies of Huawei. Okay. Then another question is, speaking about help in a foreign country, what can, not necessarily from the state of Hawaii, but there's the U.S. Department of Agriculture um, officers in the, especially the bigger embassies. So <laughs> Tokyo, of mm -hmm. course, has several people from USDA there. What kind of help do you know can, are they there to offer? Um, yes, uh, usually those uh, USDA foreign agriculture service people are in the major countries and cities. In, for Japan, Tokyo has a director and they're a specialist uh, under them. And they just opened the Osaka director position. I mean, uh, somebody got assigned the director in Osaka as well. Um, for each market, if you, first I, I encourage everyone to go to USDA FAS website and then <clears throat> they have Oh, they are offering some activities. Um, they are hosting so that you can participate. That's one of them. Or you have like any general questions regarding exporting to that market, they should be able to answer any questions. Many of the time they just refer to me, but, <laughs> but still they, they have uh, resources and if you, what we do is like uh, um, some company met uh, a importer uh, through trade show. They, they asking if they are legit or not. Then I refer to them and ask those questions because they have a list of importers of each cate categories. And if they know them, then I think that's good. We, we get the good feedback on that. Have. An another online question is about, is there any e-commerce opportunities for Hawaii companies selling agricultural products from Hawaii to Japan or Korea via Rakuten or something? Yeah, e-commerce is getting big in Japan as well. Rakuten is one of the biggest. Um, but. But I, my understanding is it's, there's no shortcut for, it's, a, it's still export and you have to comply with. Comply with mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I think the only, there, it's not a shortcut, but one possibility is to have um, a, a distributor or somebody stock product in Japan and then Rakuten would just fulfill that order online. Right? Yeah. But, but in order to stock it, you still have to follow every yeah. procedure. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's why I think uh, your importer can distribute to the those uh, e-commerce site. And, then and and yeah, that that's that's um, that that's what what you're starting to see people do in Japan. I mean, we were just visited by our importer, and um, he was looking at getting more into the e-commerce side of of. Um, with the produce, so it's happening. Um, you know, like, like over here in the U.S., I mean, everybody does that now. And in Japan, they're, they're kind of trying to expand that. All right, you two gentlemen have a lot of experience with Japan. Your companies have a lot of experience with Japan also. Do you do any marketing on your website or social media or anything in Japanese language? Uh, our importer does um, stuff on the internet with, with with our company. We gave him the the uh, license to do that. So he does it on on his websites. He has all of our stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that's I mean it's pretty much the same for us. Um, we don't we don't do anything here. E even in Hawaii, we don't do Japanese translation at our store. We don't do you know any ads we we tried once one in the hanaho um hawaiian airlines um japanese magazine but the mm -hmm. impact was kind of minimal so um we let the experts do it yep okay. <laughs> and um there's another question here about organic do you know how, what's the organic market in japan like is that is it a solid market or is it growing or would would companies and consumers in japan 
prefer to buy Hawaii products that are organic. And, and so the follow-on, does, does USDA organic translate to Japan organic? Because in China, it's, it's totally different. Right. I have to check with the um, that uh, website one more time, but uh, I believe uh, USDA organic uh, still has to be certified uh, um, Japan organic. There might be agreement already, um, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, to acquire the organic certificate, you have to go through that uh, MHLW. So you have to get approval from them to be able to say organic in Japan market. Okay. Yeah, and then organic um, interest is growing definitely, as I said, like uh, they're very health conscious and you know, they wanna live long, they wanna eat safe food and organic seems like um, they, they are very popular, but um, and uh, so that's why when they come to Hawaii, the agriculture in Hawaii is all organic. Some some people think it's not true, though. Um, that's why they have a resistance to GMO. That's very strong. Well, this is just a perception I have, but I feel like when I, if I go into a Whole Foods in Hawaii, it seems to me at least half of the people in the in the market are Japanese or Japanese tourists. If, feels like so I don't know if they're trying to <coughs> buy specifically local organic products they cannot uh, buy organic fresh produce and then bring home so they are there for I think experience it's a little bit different uh, style of the supermarket if you have ever been to Japanese supermarket it's um, the the display is uh, in Japan. Uh, no, in Japan it's all packaged. You can't touch. So you don't buy one single um, apple from that display. So it's all packed, and and that's all like a traceable when packed. Where, where is the origin? Everything. So you can't so, pick a grape. No, you no. can. <laughs> so that's. That's, I mean, that, that's, that's Japanese preference, but when they are traveling, they are so attracted by the different style, and then if they, if they learn, oh, this is the job, I mean, the, the US way of presentation, they, they were like, wow. So uh, it's like a wonderland for, for a supermarket. Okay. Yeah. Um, another question, is, uh, follow on for Korea, with Chorus, does that, um, have any impact on organic or not? Do you know? I don't think because organic you get um, benefit from the agreement. I don't think so. That's uh, it, it's based on the HS code, and those code categorized products will be excluded from the tariffs. There was one other online question. Somebody had some experience with. Japan, and they found for their product, it was a bit confusing whether their product was actually to be imported as pharmaceutical or a food product. And do you know where the line is drawn there? Yeah, I think it, it should be the HS code. Okay. Yeah, and then if it's a pharmaceutical, it the law to regulate the importation is different, food and drug. It's not the food sanitation law. So candles, cosmetics, shampoo, they all uh, fall under the different laws. They, I'm not familiar with. <laughs> Generally, though, that's not a Department of Agriculture that kind of moves more toward it. Yeah. And then even the importer side, they have to have the license license food my uh, food importers cannot import those uh, food and I mean the drugs shampoos okay. Great. Now. Uh, when, when I have uh, to use a custom customs agency when the exporter uh, have to use that uh, 
sorry, but I, I speak Spanish and I'm from to Peru and in Peru it's different try to export something. For example, we use a customs agency when I export uh, like five dollars the amount. So it's similar here. Well, you mean like a, you need an export license from Peru to send it out? Yes. Uh, there's nothing agricultural export. License. For example, if I a uh, beginner export, so I want to send, I don't know, uh, 50 chips or uh, chips uh, is a minimum. Uh, it's a minimum. So mm -hmm. when I use a agency. Oh, I see. Uh, no. I wouldn't really think so. There's no. Yeah. No. no. And your help that, that you guys offer from the Department of Agriculture, there's no fee. In Oh, f from Department of Agriculture, no fee, but uh, how about inspection fee? Um, they do, right? Well, like, like on the egg side, I mean, f there are fees that, that you have to pay. I mean, you got if you're doing agriculture stuff, you, you, you're you paying in um, phytosanitary uh, inspection fee. Yeah, it it depends on what your volume is, and you can it the low is the low is sixty one. I think the high is over a hundred. Um, but that's for ag products. For for our frozen products, we do a different inspection, which is a, the certification that it's done in Hawaii, and that's done by the Department of Ag also. Um, so so before before we got to export, we got to do at least that that to to um, inspections, either a fire sanitary or a certificate of um, um, origin, saying that you manufactured your stuff in Hawaii. Okay. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Great. Um, I'll try to bring up these websites after. It's a little hard. Please join me in thanking Yukashi, first of all, for coming, talking about Department of Agriculture. It was a wonderful presentation. And <laughs> Rudy and Jim, please look for their products out in the market. And they'll hang around for a couple minutes. We can talk to if you have any specific questions about things. But thank you very much for attending today. Wonderful seminar. Yeah. Thank you. Cool.